90 minute workshop, but I'm and bashful. And so let me get myself together up here. I got a lot going on. I just got my shoe stuck in the floor. <laughs> all right. All righty, 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 roo, roo. All right. The Woman Code. This is my second book. This book came out in 2014. It's its fifth year anniversary this year. I've literally been around the world to talk about this book. This book, when it came out in 2014, sold out on every continent on this planet. And it has been my honor. And um, five years later, we're still going strong. My third book, uh, E Pluribus One, Re, what's the subtitle? Reclaiming Our Founders' Vision for a United America. Uh, that's a political book, but you should get that one too. And to my sisters of color in the room, particularly my African-American sisters, you should really buy the first book, Black Woman Redefined. I wrote that when I was covering Mrs. Obama at the White House. And um, she actually has a, a letter in the paperback edition. So um, wonderful woman. We all love her. But that book, I think, is very important for corporate diversity and inclusion, but just understanding what it means to be a woman of color in the world. And we're going to talk a little bit about that, that intersectionality that we as women have. So we're going to get started. Um, right away. Now listen, I like tweeting, Facebooking, Instagramming. Let me give you the hashtags so you have them. You should already know them. Uh, Microsoft Women at MFST. Did I get that right? Okay. And then the hashtag for today, which is International Women's Day, is IWD2019, or you can do IWD19. You can always do Microsoft Women, and of course the woman code. All right, you guys ready? All right, let's get started here. Now, let's hopefully I did this right. All right, reflection. We are better together. Now, what the woman code is about is this. It's pretty simple. Everything you need, listen to me. I need you to hear this. Everything you need to win at life, ladies, it's already in you. It's already there. So often and so much from the time we're little girls, we are taught that our validation is outside of us. But it's not. The greatness and the power of being a woman is in here. And what I really want to impart to the ladies here and to this next generation of women, I'm a Gen Xer, so I'm talking to the women that are now millennials and Y and Z, and I don't know the other names that they have for you. <laughs> but we have some baby boomer women in the room, Gen Xers. I don't probably don't have any greatest generation that was, would be women really in their 80s and up, so probably none of those, but we are grateful for them. And we, I'm going to fall in this hole, I'm telling you. It's going to be awesome. Make sure you get a picture of it when it happens. <laughs> but I want you to understand something about this reflection. We are better together. Ladies, we all talk about the boys' club. We talk about how the boys do it. You know why the boys do it better? One, they've been at it longer, because there's been a boys club a lot longer than there's been a girls club. But boys learn from the time they're this big to play sports. They learn the brotherhood. They bounce each other around. They get over it. They don't hold grudges. They're, they're wired differently, and they're socialized differently. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because we have these days, these International Women Days. We have all these great holidays where we talk about the power of being women, and then we go right back to the workplace, we go right back to our sororities, to our clubs, and we're mean to each other. And we're not going to be mean to each other. So I want you to understand, if you hear nothing else I said today, the woman next to you, everybody look at the woman next to you. Look at her. How are you? You're pretty. Thank you. Now look, I know I got a lot of guys in the room too and they're looking at me like, is there anything in here for me? Yes, stick with me. You got a wife, you got a girlfriend, a daughter, you're gonna love this, okay? But that woman sitting next to you, you don't know that can end up being your best friend in life. That woman sitting next to you could be your boss someday, your superior, your colleague, your teammate. You don't know what happens when we get together. It is power in motion when we collaborate versus competing, I'm not saying you can't compete, because you can. But there's magic in women when we put our minds to something and we work together. Think about 
the women in your life. Think about when you were sick. Think about if you had a mom maybe that went through breast cancer or maybe you yourself did or you had some crisis or tragedy. It's the women in your life that show up with the food, with the love, with the encouragement, with the hugs. It's women. Guys, we're better people. <laughs> so, you know, we love you. But we're better together. So I really want that to stick in your minds today. All right, now this one I threw in because you guys are in the world, you're in the tech world, and I really just wanted to talk about this real quick. You can look at these numbers, but they, they kind of bothered me a little bit. The fact of the matter is, ladies, we're making great strides, but we have a long way to go. And these numbers, particularly in your field, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, all Apple, all the different companies, that are really shaking and moving our world. You can't go anywhere without Microsoft in your life. This is real. You can't go anywhere without Microsoft being a part of something you touch or do. And I wanted to just show you that we still get a small percentage of venture capital. That's why women couldn't start something like Uber or other companies because even if we have the ideas, we struggle to get the money. And if you look at some of these numbers, women with the credentials and with the degrees, they may get into industry, but then they get out of industry. And I just want you to have a handle on the fact that while things, while things are very good right now, and you may be saying, well, God, I work at Microsoft. I'm at one of the world's great companies. That's true. But at the end of the day, there's more. And I think the way we get there is with a sisterhood where we help each other. Remember, we're better together. All right, now, like I said, I got a lot to cover in a short period of time. So what I want to do is I want to start with a quote from the book. And by the way, you don't know this yet, but you're getting a copy of this at the end of, um... in fact, it's not just this group. Everybody at the conference is getting a copy. And thank you, Microsoft. Thank you, Microsoft. So I want to read to you, I broke this down into three sections. The first section and the most important section about anything we do in our lives is dealing with self. It's good to point the finger at others. It's good to blame other people. It works till it's not working. The bottom line is dealing with you is the most important tool for success you can ever have. The most important tool. All right, I just want to read to you this quote. It opens the book. Code number one is know your value, by the way. And I know people are saying, well, you know, I'm accomplished and I've got degrees and I work at a great company and I got money in the bank, I'm doing good. That has nothing to do with your value. Zero. What you do is not who you are. What you do, ladies, is not, and gentlemen, is not who you are. But let me read this quote to you because it is just one of my favorite parts of the book and it's um, by Joy C. Bell. She's an amazing author. And she wrote a great book called Wolves of the Sapphire Sun. If you haven't read it, read it. Wolves of the Sapphire Sun. And it is an amazing book about the wolves in each of us women and how amazing we can be when we run with the sun. Anyway, here's what the quote says. Let's hope that Sophia can read because she grabbed the wrong glasses today. <laughs> you can be the most beautiful person in the world and everybody sees light and rainbows when they look at you. But if you yourself don't know it, all of that doesn't even matter. Every second you spend on doubting your worth, every moment that you use to criticize yourself is a second of your life wasted. All right, put a pen in it, Sophia. Some of you needed to hear that today because you're your own worst critic. Your heart on yourself. You talk bad about yourself, you look in the mirror. You're ugly today. You're fat today. You would, don't talk to yourself like that. <laughs> it's not like you have forever. Boy, isn't that the truth. So don't waste any of your seconds. Don't throw even one of your moments away. What is she saying? Know your value. Know your value. It's code number one. Everybody's made up of three parts, mind, body, soul, but you don't need to know that because I've already, you, you figured that out. So let's get to the first one here, know your value. Okay, so this is the key to everything you do in your life. Again, your degrees, all of your accolades are nice, ladies, 
But if you don't like you, nobody will. If you don't love you, if you don't respect you and honor you and nourish you, so many women in here, look, the hashtag for today is what? It's balance for better. I hate that hashtag. You know why I hate that hashtag? Because there is no work-life balance. That's the biggest lie ever perpetrated in the history of mankind. There is no balance. There is only life integration, meaning you gotta do it all, and you gotta figure out how to make it work. And you can see that one of the little squiggly bars jumped up top, that's hilarious. At any rate, what I'm saying to you is this. You want to know the key to success. You want to unlock the key to your life. It's knowing your value and your worth. You against you will always be the biggest enemy you have in your life. You against you. So if you don't like and love you, others never will. Your value is not determined by others. It's not determined by your job. It's not determined by your paycheck. It's not determined by your relationship status. It's determined by how you feel about you. Every woman in this room and every man in this room knows a woman, a leader, someone that they love to be around. They have this infectious spirit. It's wonderful. When they walk into the room, everybody wants to be around them. That's because that person knows their value and they know their worth. And we all know the people who shrink back. And it's okay to be shy. But there are people who are walking around, people sitting right in this room who are amazing. And you don't even know it because you're so busy talking bad about you, putting you down, feeling like you're not enough and you'll never be enough that you don't even know that there is this amazing wolf, this she-wolf inside of you. And she wants to run. And you need to unleash her. You need to unlock her. Okay? Know your value. This one's big. Teach people how to treat you. Now... Everybody in this room has had somebody disrespect you, dishonor you, not talk to you, right, particularly in the workplace. And you're looking at that other person like, what is wrong with them? Well, the reality is something is wrong with them. But you know what? Something's more wrong with you. And do you know why? Because you keep putting up with it. If you're in a bad relationship, ladies, and statistically, I'm bowling down somebody's alley. I know the number's cold. In this room, there's a woman or two or ten that are in abusive relationships. Some of you have bosses that came straight out of you nowhere. You are not happy with your relationships. And do you know why? Because you let people treat you any old way. They talk to you crazy. They do at home. Your kids talk to you crazy. Whatever's happening. The bottom line is, if you don't set some boundaries and you don't honor you, it goes back to code number one, knowing your value. When you know your value, you teach people how to treat you. You teach them how to talk to you right, to show up right. Now, look, we all have bad days. We all are going to have relationship challenges. That's okay. That's normal. But I want you to really understand this one. It isn't about what somebody else is doing to you. That makes you a victim. And you are not a victim. You are empowered, powerful she-wolves. And you must teach people how to treat you. Boundaries. How many of you have good boundaries in your life? Okay, not a lot of hands went up. Okay. And that's because, you know why? You've been taught as a woman, men don't have this issue. They didn't. Is that as women, we are taught to do what? Take care of everybody else before ourselves. Even to the point when we're sick, in bed. Some of you got kids, husbands, you know, you know what a man's like when he gets sick? A cold and he's ready to die. You can have a flu, have surgery, and you're still getting up trying to fix the soup and fix the dinner. <laughs> Ladies, work-life balance is a lie. I told you that. It's not true. Been good to will do for you. Not only are they going to throw you a hell of a going away party, but <laughs> what they're going to do is, what they're going to do is they're going to get together in a network and say, well, let's make sure we get her a contractor. Let's make sure she lands somewhere. Let's take care of her because but for her, I wouldn't be here. Don't miss this code. Lift other women as you climb because what I know is that if you're Miss Nasty Girl and if you're Queen Bee and you're Mean Girl at work, they're going to be laughing when you fall down and they're going to be clapping and be like, mm-hmm, I knew it was coming. I knew she was going to go. 
You don't want that to be you. You don't want that to be you. Next. This is my favorite one. Do not think like a man. Steve Harvey, shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Why would we ever want to think like a man? Love you guys in the back. But listen, this, this, this one's real, though. This one's real. We were talking about this last night when a bunch of us got together, some of the Microsoft ladies. Listen, being a woman is magic. Everything about us is special. I mean, it's thinking we can give life from our bodies. We can bring life into the world. We can sustain life. We are amazing, amazing. And yet, in corporate, and I know, I see some of you out there. You're hard girls. You won't be one of the boys. You run with the boys. Like I said, I got a potty mouth. I can drink, too. I can do all that. Great. But the reason I left law firm culture the year I was about to make partner at one of the biggest firms in this country, and you got to get the first book to read that story. But I was miserable. I hated being a lawyer. I hated being in a big firm. I liked the paycheck, but I did not like the culture was hard, and it was rough. And the women partners who, women who were, had come up when it was terrible. I mean, when they could get swatted on the behind and they couldn't say a word. When there was no power, they had those women were tough women. And they weren't happy women. And I was like, that's not going to be me. Now, I'm not saying that you can't thrive in a firm. Being, of course you can. But it's only when you get this stuff down from the beginning that you matter and there's value. You, as a woman, use your soft skills to your advantage. We can be as smart, as fierce as any man. Of course we can. But what makes us different is that intuition, is that ability to have sensitivity, is that ability to say, I need to exercise a little compassion here and a little empathy. Wait till we have the first female president. It's going to be awesome, actually. We're not going to have half the drama that we have right now, I promise you. <laughs> We're just not. Doesn't matter what party she's from, whatever. She's gonna, and guys, I know this is tough on you. I swear we love you. But this is when you, when you get invited into these rooms, this is what happens. So the point I really want to make here is that you don't have to think like a man to be a woman. You just think like you. You love the skin you're in. You do you. Being a woman is magic. It's power in motion. And don't you ever forget it. I told you you were a she-wolf. And you could run. And you could soar. You could crush if you need to. But the thing that makes us amazing is our ability to love, to forgive, to touch. And those skills serve you very well on your way up the ladder. The other skills are important, but never lose your sense of how amazing it is to be a woman. All right. Next section. Dealing with others. Okay, now this is important. We talked about dealing with you. Then we talked about how to do some thriving in the workplace. This one's important. Now, this is where I'm going to pick on you young people. <laughs> Texting is not talking. <laughs> I know that's a new flash. I know that that's, you're disappointed to hear that. A conversation is an audible to people looking at each other and speaking to each other. <laughs> Some of you have forgotten how to have conversations. Breaking up on text, asking for a divorce on text, <laughs> telling somebody you're never going to talk to them again on text, and then delete them and block them and ghost them, and they don't exist anymore. Have you taken a look at the news? Have you taken a look at your social media? Have you taken a look at how our leaders speak to each other, how they talk to us? We are coarse. And we are unkind. And I'm telling you because I've now lived long enough to say so. I'm now the wise woman in the room. I hope the day would never come, but it has. <laughs> We've forgotten how to connect as human beings. Having a courageous conversation will save your life. It will save your marriage. It will save your career. It will save your friendships. We are now too quick to cut people off. We're going to talk about that in a moment. But ladies and gentlemen, a courageous conversation is when I love you enough, I like you enough, and I care about you enough as a mentor to tell you the truth about you. Now, none of us likes to get the truth told about us. None of us. We don't like it. But you must have people in your life who are truth tellers. 
I had a sorority regional director who liked to say this quote's in the book. She said, yes, people will lead you to the water and they will let you drown. And that is the truth. Some of you got yes people in your life. You got people in your life who just smile, whatever you want. Whatever. You ever see, um, what's that movie with um, Eddie Murphy coming to America? You remember? Now, you, some of you are too young to remember that, but they're doing a remake. But um, you remember the scene where he's got the girl and she's the wife and she's barking and she's whatever you like, whatever you say. And he doesn't want that. You don't want that in your life. Men, you do not want a woman in your life that says, I know you think you do, but you don't. <laughs> Talking back is good. Pushing up is good. You want a woman that knows who she is. And ladies and gentlemen, this is a lost art. We don't have those talks anymore, and we're breaking our relationship. We're breaking relationship with family members, people, family members cutting each other off with text. Texting is not talking. Don't do it. Stop. <laughs> now, this one here, this book was dedicated to my paternal grandmother, who's been gone now for almost 20 years, and she, uh, boy, I adored her. She had a sixth grade education. She was from a small town in South Carolina, but the smartest woman I ever knew. And this one came directly from her. Never cut, baby, never cut what you can untie. <laughs> what that means is, don't burn bridges unnecessarily. Now, you millennials are real good at this one. You're real good at the cutoff, the block, the delete, and the ghost. It's not a good way to live your life because if everybody you get mad at gets cut off instead of sometimes you untie people. Anybody know what I mean by untie? Just throw it at me. Distance, space, boundaries. All that's correct. What my grandmother was saying is there's power in releasing and cutting because there are, let me be unmistakably clear, there are people you need to cut totally out of your life. They're toxic. They're bad for you. You don't have to make an announcement. You don't have to put it on Facebook or Twitter. I hate so-and-so and I'm cutting them off. <laughs> there's power. There are people who have they're stifled the life out of you. Some of you are nodding. And you knew that they needed to go a while ago. But you're afraid. Those people you cut off, but there are people, your girl, your best girl that's been with you ride or die for 20 years through health, marriage, divorce, kids, everything you can imagine, and then you have a fight because you disagreed about who's president on Facebook, <laughs> and you guys have a fight, and then you're going to cut each other off for the rest of your lives? I don't think so. Untie, step back, take a breather. You can not talk for a couple weeks. You can even not talk for a couple months. Sometimes people go their separate ways. They move. You lose touch, but you come back together again. I want to encourage you, particularly you young men and women, please stop texting your feelings, your whole dictionary of why you got to leave and why you can't come back. That's just not, no. Talk. It will save. Get face to face, have a cup of coffee, stop being cowards, because that's what this is all about, being a coward. When, you, when you're doing this stuff, when you're not talking, you're a coward. And when you're just cutting people off, you're the problem. It's not them, it's you. If you got 50 people you cut off in the last two years, you're the problem. <laughs> I got a friend who's been married, he's on wife number seven. <laughs> I said to him one day, I won't say his name because I know this is being recorded. But I said to him one day, I said to him one day, you do know that you are the problem, right? And he started laughing, well, yeah, I guess I am. Uh, okay. I'm like, you think? Seven wives. Marriage is not for you. You should have stopped at three or two. Next. All right, again, I apologize for the little squigglies moving up. That happens when you put these things on drives. But this one's it. This was the coup de grace. My grandmother used to love to say this, and then I'll end with this, and then I'll take some questions. How are we doing on time? Oh, we're good, actually, on time. Actually, we have a, I actually could have talked a lot more. Interesting. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll throw in some of the other ones kind of off the top of my head, which is fine. But this one here is really important because my grandmother used to say, you better know your front row. You better know your front row. What does she mean? Front row. Front rows are reserved for the most important. When we buy tickets, 
the front row people paid the most money. When we go to the sports games, the front row people paid the most money, right? The front row of your life is reserved for the most important people. And then you, we all have rows and layers, and then there's balconies, and then there are doors and exit signs. <laughs> I want to encourage every woman and man in this room today to do a row check. What do I mean by a row check? I want you, and you don't tell anybody, I want you to write in your journal, ladies, some of you men do too, but I really want you to do an assessment because here's what we know for sure. Leadership Principles 101 teaches us this, that the five people that you spend the most time with in your life determine the trajectory of your life. Young people, listen to me. And I say this to kids in high school all the time and in college because that's where you're most apt to make the most dangerous choices about who you hang out with, who you marry, what you do. This one's important in your life who celebrate you, who elevate you, people who actually like you. How many of you have friends sometimes like, you don't even like me, why are you my friend? <laughs> you guys have, you know people like that, right? You're like, why are you around me? Those people cannot be in the front row of your life. You must choose people who are going to, what I like to call, Bishop Jakes calls it 10 gallon people. I'm a 10 gallon person and I tend to attract pint sized people. As do most 10 gallon people and there's a rationale for that because I pour, I pour. Many of you are pourers, but guess what? You keep pouring, you keep pouring, you're gonna get empty. And that's why some of you are agitated, aggravated, and irritated because you're drained. You're tired. Every woman in this room, if we tell truth, we're tired. We're exhausted. Am I right or is it just me? Anybody exhausted? Yeah. And you don't even know it sometimes until you realize that you're snapping and you're whatever. And that's because it's the law. It's a universal law. I must be poured back into when I pour something out. Ladies, we're not filling our cups with the right people because every day you are with people. You are connected to people. And if you have the five wrong people in your life, this thing is like clockwork. You're not going to go in the right direction. Some people miss their calling because they had the wrong friends. Some people had the, the ability to go to the NFL or to the NBA or to the, the, the ballet, wherever it was, but they had people in their life telling them they couldn't do it or it wasn't possible. you got to get rid of those people and move them further and further back to the point that they've moved out. Again, you don't have to announce this. You do not have to call to mind and say, I did a road check, Sophia told me to do a road check. <laughs> and I got bad news for you. <laughs> you didn't make the cut. <laughs> They're like, what are you talking about road check? You'll figure it out when you don't hear from me ever again. <laughs> so, what I'm saying to you is, you have to build trust and you have to be trusted. You have to be a truth teller and you have to have truth tellers in your life. My row is the reason and my mother's sitting right there in the front. She's one of the biggest people, Coppin, who's been with me forever, one of my other dear friends in business. And, and it is having people in your life who love you enough. And there are only a few people that can do this in my life, but who can really look at me and say, yeah, okay. And of course, your mother's always going to be that person. No matter how big or famous you get, you get off TV, you come home, she's like, you didn't take the trash out, or I need you to do, and you're like, oh, okay, I got it. My point is, this row, think of this room, there are rows. Your life is like a movie theater. It has rows and it has layers. I want you to do this self-check. I want you to write down the five people that you spend the most time with in your life. And again, keep this to yourself. Now, if your spouse is on this list, we have a problem. And I don't want you to go home and tell your spouse you did a road check and they gotta go, okay? You, you, you need, that means counseling and talking to the pastor, dude, I, I wanna encourage you to do that. But if your spouse's name is on that list of somebody that's not giving you what you need, that means you gotta go back to that other code we talked about, which one? Courageous conversation. Do not send him or her a text. Talk about it. Your row is everything to your life. Now, what I want to do is this. We've got about 20 minutes left, and I want to just 
talk for a moment about the woman code, and then we kind of can you want to do some questions, whatever. Again, I shortened this because it's normally a 90-minute presentation. I didn't want to run over time. But I think that a couple codes I didn't hit on are worth talking about. Code number two in the book, code number one is know your value. Code number two is make peace with your past. I'd like to talk about that for a moment. And I'm going to get a little zen on you, but that's okay. Because what I believe is that we focus too much now in corporate on exterior, on credentials, on dotting I's and crossing T's. All that matters. But if you're not a happy person, if you're not a good person, and we can debate about what that definition means, but every one of us in this room has a story. We have a past. We have those tapes. And a lot of us in this room are lugging stuff. We're carrying bricks. We got stuff weighing us down from 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 10 years ago, and it's holding us back. And one of the things that happens when you make peace with what is behind you, it allows you to go forward. It allows you to go upward. And I want to encourage you as you go through this book, because it's broken down into sections. It starts with the personal, then it goes to the emotional, then it goes to the spiritual, then it goes to the professional, and finally ends with the relational. And if you don't do the work, and I know you're saying to me, Sophia, I don't have time to do the work. I barely have time to sleep at night. That's a problem. And I want to impart this to you while you're young, because there's an article I want everybody in this room to get. The Atlantic Magazine has an article out this month called Workism. You guys have probably heard about it. Everybody's reading it 300 times and talking about it. And it's because we all know it's true. We're all workaholics. We don't put the phones down. We don't put the iPad down. We're never off. I loved when I was in college, not only because in the late 80s, mid to late 80s, there was no videotapes. So I never have to worry when I run for office about a videotape coming out of any kind. Not that there was anything to be worried about, but I'm sure there were moments at the sorority or whatever where things got a little bit Interesting. <laughs> the point is, this generation now, everything is on. Everything happens. We're in a restaurant, two people stand up, have an argument, everybody whips their camera out. <laughs> it's like I was coming here and I'm looking at people across the street and they're just, they're not even looking, they're just doing this. And I want you to understand that if you don't do the work on you and you don't make time to teach people how to treat you and you don't practice being authentic, which is code number four, be authentic. How many of you in here are doing exactly what you thought you'd be doing? You don't have to raise your hand. But I'm telling you that day in the law firm, when I was about to make partner and all that, and I knew I was miserable, and I literally started having chest palpitations. And they took me across the street to George Washington University. I'm only 30 some years old. And the doctor says, there's nothing wrong with your heart. You're fine. What's the real problem? I told her I was miserable. I hated my life. I wanted to be a journalist. I wanted to be on TV. I wanted to write. I wanted to talk. <laughs> Guess what? After that day, I made a decision. I was going to pursue that. Now, fast forward many years later, let's tell you how it turned out. I'm now on Morning Joe, I'm an MSNBC contributor, I am a Pulitzer-nominated author, I have three best-selling books, an award-winning journalist. What am I telling you? Not to toot my horn, that's not the point of the lesson. The point is, I did what Gaga said. I had a dream, and I woke up in my early 30s and realized if I don't jump now, this is the rest of my life. I was dating the wrong guy. But he had a great job at Deloitte. I was at a big firm. We were already making a half million dollars a year between the two of us. With that big house. Cute kids, but I didn't really like him. <laughs> I'm saying this to you because there's somebody sitting in this room, probably more than one somebody who knows exactly what I'm saying. And I'm trying to encourage you because when I was coming up, and some of us in the room who are 40, 50, and up, we did not have conferences like this. They didn't exist. There were not women. Oprah was about it. Oprah was who you turned on the TV to get 
something when you were a young woman because that was it. I'm not joking. Ask some of your older female colleagues how much the world has changed. You guys are getting poured into. You're getting tools. We're teaching you things that nobody taught us because they didn't exist. We didn't know as women. You had to be the trailblazers. You had to open doors. Do you know how many firsts we as women are still making in 2019? Firsts. We're one of the few countries on earth that has not had a woman president. Think about that. And yet we're 50 plus percent of the population. My point is this. We have to do the work, ladies, on ourselves. And the goal of this workshop here today was to give you what I call the soft tools. And those are the tools about you doing the work of what's going on in here. Because this is where all the chaos stays. This is how we get sick. We were talking at lunch about heart disease and diabetes and all the different things that happen from a manifestation of how we don't take care of ourselves, but in how poorly we eat. And when you're busy all the time, you eat McDonald's, you eat whatever you can find because it's all you have to eat. So you're not eating healthy. You're not, how many of you in here really sleep? It's terrible. Thank you for being honest. I'm one of those people. And no matter how hard you try, you're, you're always, uh. Step back and know your value because everything emanates from that one right there, knowing your value. And when you know that, you will sleep, you will take care of yourself. Yes, and I talk to myself like this all the time. Okay, it's only 24 hours in a day. So you gotta eat, you have to bathe, you have to do certain things. So there has to be a time in there where you just breathe you time will make you better. If you're happy, your marriage is going to be happier, your family's going to be happier, and you're going to thrive more at your job. It's just, it's just factual. So again, this is probably different from anything you've gotten today, and I'm glad about that, but you're going to love the book. And I encourage you to start a book club within, and because this is something you have to do over wine, lots of it. <laughs> and um, you, know, you could do tea too, or coffee in the morning. But this is one of these books that you're going to dig into and you're going to, people send me pictures, clubs. I mean, some women from South Africa did a video and they sent it to me. And I mean, it's humbling to me because when you read the story of why I wrote this, it was out of heartbreak. I mean, I, you know, my, I was about to get married and it, it didn't work out. And it was women that came and saved me because I didn't want to come out of my house. I was sleeping on the floor, balled up. I was in bad shape. And I never forget three of my sorority sisters one day called me on my phone and they said, go to your front door. I said, I don't want to go to the front door. They were at the front door. <laughs> one flew from California, one flew from Michigan, and one flew from Atlanta. You better get some friends like that in your life. <laughs> There's a great story in the Bible, and I'll end with this because I am a spiritual girl, and I know this is a corporate conference, but God's okay. <laughs> There's a great story in Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. And it's a story about a man who's been paralyzed his whole life since birth. And he's got these friends that have grown up with him. And he's paralyzed and he lays on a mat and he can't get up. And so his friends hear that Jesus is coming to town. And Jesus is at Peter's house hanging out. You know, good old Peter always having a good party. And so they're at Peter's house. And they said, well, look, why don't we go and... Try to see if we can get our friend healing. So the story goes that they pick up the mat and they walk to Peter's house. But when they get to Peter's house, they can't get in because there's so many people from all around. Now, most of our friends and most people at that point would have said, look, man, I tried to take you. I can't get in the door. But, you know, we love you. Leave you laying there on the mat. <laughs> That's not what these friends did. What these friends did was they picked up his mat they walked up the side of the hill and they cut a hole through the roof and they lowered him down and then he got his healing. What's the moral of the story? The moral of the story is you in this audience and all of us better get some Mark chapter 2 friends. <laughs> you better get a row of people in your life that love you enough to go to the wall that will check you when you're wrong, that will lift you as they climb. Your real friends, Oprah and Gail, <laughs> Gail 
Love Gail. Gail's a smart woman. Wouldn't take anything from her. But let's be honest. If Oprah's your BFF, life's kind of good. <laughs> and, but Oprah was that friend that, look at how many superstars Oprah made. Dr. Oz, uh, Dr. Phil, Susie Orman, Jan Levanzen. All these people started on Oprah's show 20 years ago. Oprah's got the Midas touch because Oprah lifts as she climbs. Don't miss that. Some of you have been taught wrong. I'm here today to tell you, get over it. It is not the way. It ain't all about you. It's about other women and their success and the global sisterhood of women. We are one sisterhood. I don't care what color you are, what your background is, and we need to start remembering that we are better together. Thank you. All right, we got about um, three minutes left, and I will take some questions. Katie, you want to play Vanna White there with the microphone and help? Yeah, so I'll take a couple questions. Anybody? Thoughts? Comments? Sure. Yes, Thank ma'am. You. You're great. Thank um, you. My name is Rebecca, and I'm a manager of the services side. So you've obviously established your brand very well, recognizable brand. If you were to design a T-shirt with one word across it that best describes who you are, what is your one word? Energy. That's a good word. Mine's happy. I'm just always in motion. Yes. What would you look for in a good mentor these days, and uh, how do you determine who you'll mentor? Well, I still have my mentors around. Many of them are, you know, uh, older now and retired. But uh, there's a difference between a mentor and a sponsor, right? Yeah. And let's define that quickly. A mentor is someone who you can talk to, confide in, bounce things off of. Uh, that person can be at work. They can be outside of work. But that person is really the person that's kind of like a guide for you. And um, they look out for you. They tell you the truth. They're a truth teller. They protect you. A sponsor is someone very different. A sponsor can also be a mentor. But most sponsors are people that will open doors for you. You may never see them again. There are people that have come into my life and been around my life that saw something in me, made a phone call. I have never gotten a job in my life by applying for it, never, not a one. It was always somebody picked up the phone and said, I like her, bring her on, she's great. That's that relationship, that's that connectivity, and we've lost that because we think going on to Monster, all these sites, yeah, you can get a job, but the way you're gonna succeed in your career is having a good balance of mentor and sponsor and people who will feed into you, but also see that you've got a talent and they're going to pour into that talent and make sure that you get on the path you're supposed to go on. So somebody at Microsoft could see you're a super genius at something that Microsoft really doesn't do that well and say, you know what, I got a friend who's over at XYZ place and they're doing X and I think you would be great at that. We don't want to lose you, but that's where your gift is. Pay attention to those people. Those people, I believe, are angels in a sense. They come into your life because I think we're always trying to get to where we're supposed to be on that path, right? So hopefully I've answered your question, but for me, the traits I look for, all my mentors were men. I had very few female mentors because they just didn't exist. And so this notion that a white man, girls of color out here, this notion that a white man can't be your mentor is bogus. It's not true. It absolutely can be. It can be your best advocate, teacher, everything. So don't just always look for who looks like you because... Some of my worst bosses have been women. Just saying. And um, I made a vow, I'll never work for another woman again. That's the wrong thing to say, but the reality is when I was coming up, it was different. I think it's very different now. And I think women are taking care of each other more and lifting, and at least we're cognizant that we have to do better before there wasn't even that cognizance. So look for people who are honest, of integrity. Look for people who are where you want to be. When I wanted to become a journalist, Steve Luxenberg, who was editor at the Washington Post at the time, gave me my first break, gave me a double-page article on a Sunday opinion piece. It 
is what led to my first book because I wrote a story about a young senator's wife. This young senator was named Barack Obama and his wife was coming under fire uh, because she said she was proud of her country for the first time or whatever Michelle Obama said. And I went ballistic and was like, yeah, this is how they always treat us as black women. It was called Black Female Accomplished Attack. Google it. That article changed my life. It was the most viral article the Post ever had. It broke the website. And from that, a book deal came, and the rest is history. My point is Steve took a chance on an unknown, never published anything before other than in college newspaper, and he liked what I had to say, and he put it on the Sunday Opinion in the Washington Post. Life-changing moment. You've got those moments in you, too. It doesn't just happen for me. Next question. I got, can I take one more, two more, Katie? Yes. OK. But you're doing great. <laughs> I know there are more, because I see some of you kind of sort Yes, ma'am, it's already here. I think we can feel really confident and excited about ourselves, but we can have friends who are awesome, badass ladies, and they don't see it in themselves. How do we rally around those women and get them lifted up and seeing what we see? I have a group at my house every month. Um, it's kind of part of my church, but it's, it's called a Woman Code Connect group. And um, we have a core group of us that come, but you know, sometimes we'll have 25 women over the house. and. And I invite women intentionally who I know are struggling with something. And then I'll have like smaller sessions with just 10 of us. And there were like a few of us the other night and found out one of the ladies in her group had skin cancer and she hadn't even told anybody. And it's because she was keeping it to herself. And then she just broke out crying and we're like, oh my God, what's wrong? And then, you know, of course, wine helps this stuff to flow out and we talk about it. <laughs> but my point is this, to your question. It's a great question because you already know, you realize that there are women who have power and greatness in them, but they're shy or no one's ever spoken it into them. That's what I'm talking about. Invite that person. Every woman in this room, a couple things I want you to do, men too, but ladies in particular. I want you to spend over the next couple months, get to know somebody that looks nothing like you, that's not from your same, but go out of your comfort zone and just sit down with another woman and have a cup of coffee and just listen and get to know each other. And that's how we establish relationships so that we can pour into and bless each other. The power of life and death is in what? Our words. The power of life and death are in our words. So what somebody speaks to you, remember I talked about those tapes that we have from childhood, oh, your sister's the smart one, your sister's the prettier one, oh, that's your, my, this. Parents do that stuff and they don't get it, but it happens. I was lucky that I got positive affirmations poured into me like that you could pretty much do anything, but not everybody gets that. So we as women have to be kind enough and sensitive enough and sisterly enough to simply say to another, you look great today, and be, that's good. And just the kind little things you don't know, you may change somebody's whole, not just their day, but their life. I don't know what it's gonna do for you that you came here today. But I suspect when you're a lady in your 70s, you're going to tell your grandchildren, I met this crazy lady on the train. <laughs> and we talked, and I read her book, and she invited me, like, you know, whatever. And, and, and I hope that's the case. But what I really hope is that when you get to be my age, or even before that, you pass it on. Because it's about when somebody does something good for you and blesses you, you owe them the lift, because you're climbing but bring up women with you. Ladies, we gotta get over this competition thing we do, like I can be the only one. That's operating from a place of fear and of lack. And as Yoda would, day, Yoda would say, fear leads to the dark side, right? <laughs> so get over fear, get over fear. The woman, everybody look at the woman next to you again and we're gonna close. Take a look at her. That woman, like I said, could be the best friend you ever had. She could be your business partner someday. I don't know what she's going to be. But what I do know, uh -oh. I unleashed a bad thing here. Yes. What I do know, ladies, give me a second. See what I did? My fault. 
But if you don't know that woman next to you, exchange cards, get to know each other. Ladies, that's all my time. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate you.